Well, hello and welcome to the UMB Law Podcast. My name is Michael Marin, and I'm the Acting Dean of Law at UMB. We begin all of our events by recognizing and respectfully acknowledging that the UMB Law community gathers on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of Wolustaqui. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with the Honorable Frank McKenna, a graduate of the UNB Law class of 1974. Mr. McKenna has had a remarkable career in law, politics, diplomacy, and business. At UNB Law, he was a Lord Beaverbrook Scholar and co-winner of the 1973 Harrison Shield. Following graduation, Mr. McKenna practiced criminal law in Chatham, New Brunswick, serving as counsel in several high-profile cases and appearing before the Supreme Court of Canada. In 1982, he entered politics by being elected to the New Brunswick Legislature. Mr. McKenna became leader of the Liberal Party of New Brunswick in 1985, and two years later, he won one of the most resounding electoral victories in Canadian history, capturing every seat in the legislature and becoming New Brunswick's 27th Premier. Mr. McKenna's government was re-elected in 1991 and 1995. His government is known for its achievements in economic development, attracting investment to the province, and improving its fiscal situation. After precisely a decade on the job, Mr. McKenna stepped down as Premier. On March 1, 2005, he became Canada's ambassador to the United States. In May 2006, Mr. McKenna joined the TD Bank Group and today serves as its deputy chair wholesale. Mr. McKenna is one of Canada's most respected political and business leaders and has advised governments and major institutions all over the world. He is a member of the Order of Canada and through his philanthropy has enabled significant initiatives at New Brunswick and Nova Scotia universities. Mr. McKenna, it's an honor for me to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure for me. That's great. Um, so why don't we start by talking a little bit about your life before law school. So you were uh, raised in Abahawk, New Brunswick, which is uh, uh, approximately between Fredericton and, and Moncton. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, well, actually, I grew up in uh, L.A., which is lower Abahawk. Um, okay. Abahawk was the metropolitan area with a hundred and some people, uh, but we lived out in the country. Uh, on a farm. Uh, so I grew up in a pretty typical New Brunswick family. Uh, uh, there were 10 of us all together uh, and then throw in a few odd cousins that came to live with us from time to time. And so we pretty well had a baker's dozen uh, around there. We had a, uh, we were poor. Um, we didn't feel poor. We had uh, relatives from Boston that gave us our clothes and uh, wore those right up to university. And of course, we had lots of food on the farm and we had each other. And so we didn't feel uh, like we were disadvantaged, but we certainly grew up poor and we just had to learn how to fend for ourselves. We had to learn to work hard um, to get a little extra money. I trapped muskrat and rabbits and mink and um, we all used to pick blueberries and strawberries and we used to do whatever we had to do to get by. And um, it was all, all part of who we became. Uh, as a family growing up. That's really interesting. And and um, you you went uh, after high school to, to St. FX, I, I, I understand. Can can you tell me a little bit about your life before law school, what you studied at St. FX and, and, and what you did in, in the years before UNB Law? Yeah, I kind of went there. Um, look, I, I've got a, a whole family of siblings who are all probably smarter than I um, am, but they ended up going different directions. Two of them became nurses, uh, uh, two of them went to agricultural college. But I had to spend part of my life with my grandmother. When my grandfather died on the farm next door, somebody had to stay with her and I stayed with her. And she, she was a really motivating, inspirational person. And she pushed me into reading when I was four or five and into trying to always excel. For, so she put something in me that uh, wouldn't have been there otherwise. And she had a son, the only one in her family that went to university. My father, during the war, stayed home to farm, which was a higher calling than being a soldier at that time. But my uncle did go off to the war and uh, 
when he came home, uh, he was funded to go to university, he went to St. Francis Xavier University. So that was the only university in our family. And she talked about it incessantly. So that probably motivated me to go there. Plus, I was from New Brunswick and wanted to get away, quite frankly. Uh, and UNB and Mount A were, were kind of close. So I ended up going there. And I ended up falling in love with that institution. And uh, I studied political science and economics there. I was very involved in student politics when I was at St. of X. And I uh, made a lot of friends that were friends for life. Oh, that's that's interesting. And, uh, you know, so often we hear stories of very successful people who sort of trace their ambition back to a relative, a family member, a parent who sort of really instilled those values of ex excellence and, and expectation, particularly education. We see this a lot in in sort of educational outcomes that what, what seems to matter most is not so much socioeconomic background, but actually the value that the family places on on education um, and, and excellence. So it sounds like you very much fit that that mold. Yeah, but that's something you're saying something really important there uh, because I I concluded from that my experience in life that um, that everybody has the potential to go on to higher things. It may be a, a trade school. It it may be uh, it it may be university, but the expectation has to be set in the house. And it's no accident that if parents are university educated, the kids tend to go to university. That doesn't right. mean somebody's high school educated that their children aren't just as smart. Uh, but I've learned, I learned that early childhood education is really important. Setting the bar high, creating expectations is really important. And during my time as premier, that's one of the things that I cared about a lot was making sure that we lifted everybody's expectations up and didn't feel limited by uh, by the way in which we grew up. Well, that's fascinating. And and uh, and obviously law school came into the picture at, at some point as well as an ambition of yours. So when did that uh, surface as something that you wanted to pursue? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So I left St. of X and I was lucky enough to have scholarships in various places. And I went to Queens, which had the, the best um, school of political science at that time to do my master's. Uh, degree. We had a lot of household names in Canadian political science there. I enjoyed it very much. And I was I finished all of my coursework and I had to make a decision. I, re I had received a, a Rotary Foundation scholarship to go anywhere in the world to do my PhD. And so, uh, you know, for a firm boy from Appahawk, that was just an invitation to an ice cream store. So I searched for the furthest places away and I accepted the University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa, Melbourne and Australia. I was wow. sure I was getting all the money I could out of that. And I was pretty well headed in that direction. And then we finished some graduate work. And one of the books we were studying was uh, Porter's Vertical Mosaic, which talks about kind of the uh, the Canadian political spectrum. And, and uh, part of it was analyzing parliamentarians, who they are, where they're from and so on. And it was like a revelation. It was an epiphany. Uh, I realized one day in class, looking at the charts and everything else, that political scientists weren't the people who went into politics. Lawyers were the people that went into politics. Right. It was like a eureka moment when I was saying, holy cow, why would I become a political scientist? I mean, all they do is talk about politics, but they don't really practice it. And I knew that that was something that I wanted to do. So it was a eureka moment for me. And my brother-in-law was with me at Queens doing his master's. His parents come from a long line of lawyers. Uh, they wanted him to be a lawyer. He'd been resisting his whole life doing what the family wanted him to do. And both of us one day just came to the same eureka moment. Why don't we look at law? And we applied simultaneously to, to uh, UNB, uh, to the Beaverbrook Scholarship Program. And we ended up getting interviewed. Uh, he ended up, there were three Beaverbrook scholars given that year. Uh, John uh, Friel, who was my uh, brother-in-law, uh, became a judge, uh, myself, and Ernest Drapeau, wow. Chief Justice of New Brunswick. And Ernie and I had suffered this week, actually, here at the House, and we talked about the first day that we met was the first day we got interviewed for those Beaverbrook Scholars. So uh, wow. Wow. We all ended up receiving the Beaver Books, which was good because we had to stay in the top 10 to... Uh, uh, to get through uh, to get our money, and uh, 
and we couldn't have afforded it otherwise, so that forced us to work hard. So the reason I ended up going to UNB after that, because I was lucky enough to get accepted in different places, talked to my father-in-law, who was a lawyer. He said this. He said, look, there are a lot of law schools. A lot of them are very competent. You have to decide whether you're going to be in New Brunswick in practicing law. If you are, you want to know the people you're going to practice law with and right. the people influence um, life in New Brunswick. And he said, that means going to UNB Law. And for a Dow Law graduate, that was that was a bit of a revelation. And uh, so uh, the Beaverbrook Scholarship and my father-in-law were the two things that motivated me to go to UNB Law. That's a fantastic story. And what what company to be in, eh, that the three of you did, did so well. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, one became your brother-in-law, the other a chief justice, a uh, lifelong friend. That's a that's a remarkable story. Uh, and that, that those are the kind of stories that we love to hear on, on this podcast because it's uh, it brings us all together. Right. And it's, it's inspiring for for, for everyone. Um, so you graduated from UNB Law in 1974, and I'm just wondering what what UNB Law was like back then. How do you remember it? Well, very simply, it was just the most powerful influence I've ever had in my life. Uh, and it, it just uh, first of all, I I loved uh, I loved the law school. I loved the the rigor at that time. It was extraordinarily rigorous. Uh, in terms of the academic subject matter. We had professors like Carol Doerr in contracts and Richard Byrd teaching insurance and taxation who really put us through our paces. Uh, so I, I, I learned that my mind was fungible, that it could expand uh, and more things could go in it. I never really learned before uh, about discipline and logic and the law brought those things to me. I learned that the first day uh, there, when we were learning Hadley versus Baxendale, uh, mm. I I said to myself and to others, I can't remember all of this crap. How do you remember all of this stuff? Every case name, citation, and uh, within weeks, uh, if not uh, sooner, uh, we all realized that our mind was capable of expanding. Right. And so that was a wonderful thing uh, in itself. And then the logic of the law. I was so attracted to it. it it was a kind of a Cartesian logic to it that really attracted me. And uh, the rest of my life, I realized I didn't have to learn everything, every answer in law school. I learned I had to learn how to get to the answer from what I learned in law school. So um, that that discipline was wonderful. And then I was surrounded by wonderful people. You know, I, I mentioned two of them. Earl Brewer is one of New Brunswick's most successful uh, Economic leaders was in our class. Janice Cochran went on to become a deputy minister in Ottawa. Margaret Larley who was on the Court of Appeal as well. These were all classmates. So yeah. it was a wonderful group of highly motivated, uh, highly successful people. You you were in quite a remarkable class when when you look at you know and and we've had a lots of remarkable classes, but 1974 certainly stands out in terms of the accomplishments of. Uh, of the graduates, what, what was it like to be in a in a class like that with so many? Because clearly, all of these people were so a ambitious. Uh, it, I mean, was there a royal jelly in that group, or how do you uh, account for that? I, look, I don't know. I know it was intimidating for me. I I don't, I don't want to be too self-deprecating, but you know, I I didn't. You know, I kind of had the asset of my pants uh, in life, and. Uh, and had never really uh, had much exposure to this world. Uh, Ernie Drapeau was from McLeod City in Northern Ontario. He was similar to me. And the two of us, we would look out there and see all of these buttoned down um, individuals. They come to, to university with, with suits on or, uh, uh, you know, and uh, with ties and all look really intimidating. They'd sit in the front rows and ask the smartest questions. We were just sitting there saying, holy crap. I mean, this is intimidating. And and then, uh, you know, when the marks came out, uh, 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 Mr. Justice Drapeau and I ended up becoming pretty well first and second all the way through the law school. So, right. you know, we had something going for us. And then we uh, ended up being teamed together for the Moot Court uh, Championship, and we won the Harrison Shield that year. So we realized then that, you know, it wasn't the pose you wear, it's, uh, or as the saying goes, it's not the dog in the fight, it's the fight in the dog. Right. And, 
and we we both had lots of ambition and uh, worked hard. I think there's a really, really important lesson there for for our students uh, is that you know if they if they work hard and they pursue a goal, it doesn't matter where they where they're from. There's sort of no limit to their ambition and work ethic, uh, and uh, I think that's that's really really important uh, for 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 everyone to to understand. Um, if we go sort of beyond law school uh, and, uh, and and your your early career as a, as a criminal defense lawyer, and you are involved in some high profile cases uh, like the murder trial of uh, Yvonne Zurel. Um, I'm just wondering why you chose criminal law. What what pushed you in that direction? Uh, well, I didn't really. Uh, okay. So uh, to start with, I I, I, I practiced law in a in a in a law office where we had to do everything, and okay. so I was doing wills and I was doing deeds, property transactions, commercial, uh, everything that came in the door. And uh, one day, one of my partners was uh, was tied up with something. He said, "Look, you need to go to court and uh, and do a pleading for me." I'd never been to court in my life, and uh, I had no idea what the hell a pleading was. But I ended up going to court, and I ended up doing not only a pleading but a couple of different things when I got there. And from then on, I got thrown into that every day. And in the community that I was in, the Miramichi, we had a big volume of criminal law happening, and so. <laughs> You know, we're literally doing dozens of cases a week. That's one thing that I would, you know, every lawyer is going to be different. But unless you've really been in court practicing advocacy law, you know, you're missing something. Uh, yeah. It's a really important skill to have. So I got thrown into it. And even then, I never really became a criminal lawyer. Uh, I became a litigator. I gradually gravitated towards doing more litigation. I'd say more laterally in my career it was almost all civil litigation. Okay. So plaintiffs counsel doing a lot of different plaintiffs cases. And then the insurance companies, if you're successful, they start hiring you. So I started doing a lot of insurance law. So criminal law was a bit of a sideline. And after a while, I only took large cases that uh, that were interesting. But but it was a fascinating way to learn the law. And I learned so much from that uh, discipline. I learned all about how to... Uh, um, how to influence juries, uh, how to uh, be a good advocate, uh, just a lot of things about it made me a better lawyer. That's really, really interesting. And, and oftentimes when I'm advising students, I tell them, don't be afraid to just, you know, put yourself in the fire. I mean, that's that's how you how you learn. And particularly with advocacy, I mean, you got to just try it and, you know, sure, you'll get beat up a little bit the first time, but that's how you learn, you know, and uh, just jumping into the deep end and, uh, right. and, and, you know, and I, I did my first breathalyzer case. I had a pretty good case. I drove all the way to Perth to do it. Probably got paid a hundred bucks to drive halfway across the province. And I had the case one on the facts. And because I was stupid about uh, criminal law, I put my accused on the witness stand and the judge just turned to me and he said, you know, the, the this is the only time the accused has been identified in this whole proceeding, and you've just done it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, but you learn from mistakes, right? And, and you also learn success. And we've talked about it before. Is the intersection of hard work and opportunity? Yeah. And Yvonne, is just an example. Anybody probably could have done that case successfully. I got the case because every time I got a call, no matter what time of the day it was, usually in the middle of the night, I would leave. So I, I was out to the jails or to murder scenes or accidents, sometimes three or four nights a week. And wow. when Yvonne got to jail, the police there said, you should talk to McKenna. He'll come out and see you. So we arrived down there in the middle of the night uh, and uh, and ended up, uh, he said, look, the police here, the police tell me you're the best lawyer. I said, no, 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 this is a big case. You need a serious lawyer. I said, the police keep telling me you're a serious lawyer. I said, well, not for what you're charged for. And I couldn't get rid of him as a client. <laughs> but I had that client and others because I just worked hard. I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, but I worked harder than most of the other people in the room. 
OK, so students pay attention to what Mr. McKenna just said. It's very, very important. Um, I'm wondering about your transition to, to politics. So you were elected to the legislature in 1982, but as you mentioned earlier, you were involved in student politics at St. FX. I also understand that you were involved in, uh, in politics at, at UNB Law. So, and you were even thinking about politics before law school and, and studying political science. So, so what fascinated you about, about politics and, and why did you decide to enter the fray yourself? Yeah, I, I was involved both in high school and then at St. Vex's student union president and at the law school, president of the law society. And I think it was just, I don't know, when you grow up in a large family, life is politics. It's just about how people get along, really. And I, for some reason, was just fascinated watching political leaders, at how they had the ability to make life better for people. And uh, for some reason, that just motivated me. And I always knew that was the direction I wanted to go to. The interesting thing is when I first ran in 1982, I ran because the seat had come open. Mem the member had been there for 15 years and he decided to retire. And again, it goes, uh, uh, there's a lot of life as luck if you work hard and, and you have some luck. So I was lucky that seat came open, but I almost didn't run. I was so excited about practicing law and I was so busy uh, and had such a challenging practice. I really had uh, almost concluded that I wouldn't run. And I got convinced by some other people, fortunately, to run. But it was a hard decision to make just because the law was so attractive to me. Uh, but, you know, the rest is history. I, I won in an election where our party didn't do well. I was one of the only new people around. And against a dull background, I looked pretty bright. And uh, I ended up running for the leadership, totally expecting to lose. But at a time when the public wanted new, I was new, everybody else was old. And the next thing you know, uh, I'm the premier of the province. Wow. Uh, I always thought I'm the ladder. I never thought that I would end up at the top of the ladder. Uh, so um, a lot of it just was the right, everything happening in the right way. Well, there's one aspect of your, um, your win in... Um, in 1987 that I find really fascinating. Um, so my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in the lead up to that election, you and your team did some polling and discovered that the province was quite badly divided along linguistic lines. And you were quite concerned about this, um, at least that's what I understand. And so when you crafted your platform, you did it sort of intentionally in a way that would unite the, the province. Uh, and I find that to be sort of a really interesting contrast to the type of politics we see from many politicians today, which is this sort of micro-targeting approach. You know, we don't see a lot of uh, political strategy that's focused on uniting everyone. And you want every seat in the legislature, right? So I'm just wondering what, what pushed you in that direction? What was behind that strategy? And why don't we see more of that today? Well, I, I guess a, a couple of factors to start with. I wasn't then, and I'm still not wildly partisan. I'm, you know, I, I, I just, I don't think that uh, one party is right all the time. And I, you know, so I, I just, I don't like partisanship, truthfully. I'd like to govern, but that's what I really liked. I like being the premier. I didn't like being the leader of the party so much. So, um, so when it came to run during my leadership campaign, uh, realizing that New Brunswick, they were quite angry at the government of the day. Uh, and, and there was this uh, language issue. And for some reason, I got inspired by Hunky Brewster. Now, if anybody went back through the history of TV, Hunky Brewster was a, a, a little kid, a cute little kid had a TV show and she dressed in rags and they were all different colors. They were just multi-hued. And I decided, why don't I run a campaign like Punky Brewster? So we ended up, instead of having liberal red, we ended up having effectively a rainbow as our uh, uh, rainbow of colors, as, as our, our campaign material. Everything that we did was rain, a rainbow. And basically that was to say, it doesn't matter where you sit on the spectrum, we want you in the tent. And, uh, and it was successful. It was also... Um, where my natural heart was and instincts were, 
And so I felt re really comfortable. And I ended up winning all of the seats, uh, not because all of the Liberals in New Brunswick voted for me, but because a lot of the Conservatives in New Brunswick voted for me as well, or people from other political persuasions. And I think it was because we were trying to um, attract a lot of people of different persuasions. And then because we ended up starting off with all of the seats, it really informed you as a government that you could not be partisan in your approach. You couldn't say, I'm going to look after this writing as a liberal writing, and I'm going to screw this writing because it's a conservative writing. You had to cover for the whole province. So it really reinforced my own personal instincts, and, and it ended up serendipitously, uh, I, I think, just creating a, the right atmosphere for New Brunswick at that point in time. So, so why don't we see more of that today? I mean, why is politics so divisive? Do you think that approach that you had in, in 87 would, would fly in, in 2020 or have, have things changed too drastically? There's, there's some change, certainly in the United States, there's some things if we get into it, I could tell you that have resulted in more polarization. But I think a lot of the political leaders today are, are just wrong in, in my humble view. I think the game is still played best around the 50 yard line or center ice. Uh, instead, political parties now seem to want to retreat to their end zone and, uh, and govern as if they could uh, govern without playing the, using the whole playing field. So I think it's wrong. I, I, successful politicians, Bill Clinton, uh, one as a Democrat, left-leaning Democrat, he immediately moved into the center of the spectrum and occupied it and had the longest period of uninterrupted growth in American history. George Bush ran as a little bit more right-wing Republican. He moved in towards the center. Uh, Trump ran from the right wing and moved further right wing and basically said to the rest of you, screw you, I don't need to do anything for you. I think that's just wrong. It's divisive and it's wrong. And uh, even in New Brunswick at times, some I pulled up my hair out of even some of my own party's leadership who who are more ideological and, and, and partisan than I think the mood of the province. I think the province is essentially uh, fiscally uh, conservative uh, and socially progressive province. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the public are and I think that's where the political leadership would better off be. That's really interesting. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of things about um, sort of the job of governing and of, and of being premier, because one of the challenges that premiers have is keeping their caucus together and keeping the, the cabinet together. Uh, and that can be really challenging because you have so many constituencies and you have so many interests involved. In your case, in 87, um, you know, maybe some of your colleagues thought, hey, this is great. We've got absolute power. Let's, you know, I should be able to get what I want, you know, out of out of this scenario. Um, how, how do you deal with that as a premier? How do you keep everyone united? Because I think this challenge, maybe to a lesser extent, applies to all forms of, of leadership in any organization. So I'm just curious how a premier goes about keeping his or her team together. Yeah, so that, that's a, it's a terrific question because in some ways, I think the staying together uh, with all of the seats for four years after the election was a bigger feat than winning all of the seats. Um, and I would say two things. First of all, I, le I learned from watching Brian Mulroney, who even when he when his uh, approval rating was as low as the country's unemployment rate, he still never lost a caucus member because he worked very hard interpersonally with them, uh, remembering their their good moments, remembering their bad moments, and and working with them. So interpersonal uh, skills are important. But as but in my case, what I tried to do, and I don't want to seem vain in this, but the effort was to try to, we wanted to bring a revolution to New Brunswick. We, we wanted to, I felt that I had the mandate for huge change. And so I wanted all of the people involved with me to feel a passion that was bigger than their own individual ambition. And that, you know, these, the words of the three musketeers, it was all for one and one for all, that we were all in this together. Uh, Francophone members, Anglophone members, we became our own best friends when we got to Fredericton. Uh, people who were kind of on the right wing or the left wing, we all had each other's backs. So in a way, we were united in a common cause, the same way soldiers are in a foxhole. 
whatever differences we might have had, religion or otherwise, that was all out the window. We were in the foxhole together. And uh, it was just one of the most satisfying periods uh, in my entire life being part of that. Wow, that's really interesting. The, another challenge um, of political leadership, and, and I suppose, uh, you know, lots of manifestations of leadership is having to make tough decisions. Um, oftentimes, you are dealing with controversial issues. Sometimes you have very little information to go on. And we see this a little bit now with, with the pandemic and, and governments sort of making decisions uh, in the midst of uncertainty. I, I'm wondering how you approach those kinds of decisions. Did you have sort of a, um, I don't know, a strategy or, or a system for, for how you made tough decisions? Either you didn't have the right information or you knew you were gonna potentially alienate some, some group. How did you tackle those types of things? So that, that's interesting because I was the world's worst decision maker when I started off. I couldn't, I just, I was torn in all directions. And when I ran my leadership campaign, uh, I had an old friend who kind of walked in and took it over. He said, you're not even going to get a vote if you keep it up because you've got people here who should be fired. You've got other people who should be brought in. I said, well, they all hurt their feelings. He said, leave that to me. I'll hurt their feelings. Anyway, bottom line was I just hated decisions. Yeah. And I got trainers up. I had to decide who was in what office around me and the cabinet minister. I hated that. And I just agonized over it. And in many cases, I avoided making those hard decisions. And one day I, w I went home, I remember well, and I was talking to Julie and I was just saying, God, this is killing me. You know, I've got people in positions they shouldn't be in. And I need to move them. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't know what to do. Uh, I, this, I'm really feeling the pain. And she said, are you worried about their feelings? Or are you worried about your feelings? Because you, if you want to do what you want to do in the province, you're going to have to start smartening up and making decisions, uh, and uh, and and start uh, and start taking the responsibility for that. And and it was like again a eureka moment where I realized that's what I was doing. I was shielding myself from doing the hard thing, and I changed almost overnight. And I would uh, I would try to. I would try to be people who were underperforming. I would try to give them a second chance. But if they weren't working out, I would move them out. And I had to reach the conclusion that no matter what the cost might be to them or to my feelings, what we wanted to do in New Brunswick was a little short of a revolution. And we could not have people obstructing what we were trying to do. Or that I could not be worried about public opinion obstructing what I wanted to do because I was afraid to... To, to make unpopular decisions. So I started becoming very good, I think, at, at making hard calls and basically saying, I think this is the right thing. I'm going to communicate it to New Brunswick this way. I hope they follow me, but I'm prepared for whatever happens. I learned that. The other thing that I learned uh, was that uh, 90 or 95 percent of the decisions that had to be made really weren't that hard at all. So I'd have cabinet ministers coming in every day of the week and saying, Premier, what do you think about this? Or should I go that way or this way? I'd say, go that way. The next one would come in, what do you think I should do? Go that way. Another one would come in, I'd say, say no. And one day they said, how do you do that? You just make decisions. Like, so quick. I said, yes, because if you look at what you're asking me, in 90% of the cases, it doesn't matter whether it's yes or no. So you just want a decision. It, you know, the rightness of it isn't that important. For the five or 10 decisions that are really important, we'll pull those uh, aside and we'll take the time and we'll deliberate on them and, and try to make the best informed decision we can. But 90 or 95% of the decisions we make just aren't that material. So just make the decision to move on, drive on, keep moving and driving on. So, so I learned that as well. And uh, that, that turned out to be quite magical. I think there may be a lesson there for us university administrators <laughs> because we tend to dwell on some pretty insignificant things and uh, you know may be useful for us to keep the momentum going. The universities have a monopoly on it. I, I, I it was Henry Kissinger was, wasn't it who said that uh, 
universities are hard to run because the stakes are so small or something like that. Yeah, right. I, I'm around them enough to know that process is, is, is it's hard to navigate. But anyway, that's... It, 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 it is indeed, but I think there's, there's a lesson there that sometimes we get hung up on things um, when, and, and, you know, we do have to take the time to deliberate, but sometimes we get hung up on things and, uh, you know, perhaps the certainty of the decision is more important uh, in those, in those instances. Um, that's, that's some really interesting insight. The other thing there is always listen to your partner. <laughs> that's what I, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, after you left uh, office as premier, or, or, or shortly uh, after, um, you, you eventually became Canada's ambassador to the United States, and which, as everyone knows, is a very important job for a country given our relationship with with the U.S. Um, and I'm just wondering how you go about trying to get American officials to focus on Canadian issues. And the reason I'm fascinated about this question is because I started my career in New York City uh, and, you know, I, I, I was from Montreal um, and I studied at the University of Ottawa. Most people knew Montreal. Nobody knew Ottawa. Very few of my colleagues, believe it or not, even though it was the capital. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of noise in Washington, D.C. So how did you cut through all of that and make people care about Canadian issues? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, to start with, it, becoming ambassador wasn't a great act of selfless service. Um, the Prime Minister called, asked me if I wanted to uh, I sat down and I looked at my life. I was serving on 18 boards. I was counsel two law Osters in Toronto and one here, uh, McGinnis Cooper. Uh, we had our own manufacturing business. I had five consulting contracts. I was doing about 25 speeches a year. Uh, now, I was literally at my wit's end, but I didn't really want to say no to anybody. Uh, so taking the ambassadorship allowed me to wipe the slate clean and just clean everything out of my life and focus on one thing. So I enjoyed that. But then secondly, I found, I didn't know much about being an ambassador, but I found it's the same skill set that allows you to survive in life. Um, it's all about interpersonal skills, working hard, um, getting to know people in intimate ways and, uh, and being straight, just talking straight. Americans are extraordinarily good at just straight talk. And if you deliver straight talk to them, I find they, they're very accommodating. And, you know, just everything that I did was designed to try to, create relationships. So I used I didn't used to hang around with other ambassadors because I said, why would I hang around with them? They can't do anything for me as a country. That's just a plot that I don't want to be part of. So we had a big ambassadors do at, at uh, the White House and Bush was the president and three quarters of the way through it, I had enough and I headed for the door and Bush grabbed me on the way out, President Bush. He said, where are you going again? It's not over. I said, the World Series is on. I need to I need to see the game. He said, he said I'm behind you. And uh, we became friends. Right. Uh, I had another huge battle with a senator from North Dakota who uh, over an issue. And at one point he said, look, I'm not against you because you're a Canadian. He said, I like Canadians. My grandfather was a Canadian and he was in a big duel in Canada. In fact, the last duel in Canada, somebody got shot in the court of steps. And I jumped up and I said, you son of a bee. Your great grandfather killed my wife's great grandfather, and uh, I. He said, "No crap." He said, "I thought that was a fictional story." I said, "No, it's true. I'll show you the story." He said, "Oh my God!" I said, "You owe me," and uh, he, said, he said, "God." He said, "That's interesting." So, so we sat down and we worked on our problem and we worked it out. And when I left uh, Washington, he took the flag down off Capitol Hill and gave it to me as a souvenir of my time in, in Washington. So. Every connection that you make uh, bears fruit. And uh, in, in Washington, it's, it's just important that you make those connections. Uh, uh, you know, there's a saying there, if you, if you want a friend, get a dog, uh, because everything else is around interest and connections. Wow, that's 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 really interesting. Um, why don't we just segue quickly, because we're talking about the United States to, uh, to Canada-US relations. Um, so a lot of Canadians are 
quite concerned about what's going on in the U.S. with the polarization of, uh, of politics. Uh, and that's been going on for, for some time, obviously. Um, even with uh, Biden's election, it doesn't seem to be abating. The country is still very divided. Um, what do you attribute that to? Uh, and, and do you think we should we should be concerned about it? Well, I think Americans should be concerned about it. And by extension, we should be, because they represent about a third of our market, if you just want to look at it in commercial terms. Um, yeah, there, there, are, uh, there are lots of factors, uh, uh, some of them that are kind of deeply entrenched now. Uh, the Supreme Court has become a partisan court, and as a result of their partisanship, they decided a certain way in Citizens United on the role of money in politics. And, uh, and so there are walls of money that influence these political elections, uh, and that drives certain behavior. And then the Supreme Court is really allowed or condoned gerrymandering. And George Bush would tell me the biggest single reason for America's problems today are gerrymandering. So uh, the Republicans try to organize the state. So all the Republicans are in certain areas and Democrats in other areas. In many cases, African-Americans who tend to be Democrats are crammed into the inner city. So you get that divide. You get a rural urban divide. But you also get Republicans who want to get nominated having to go to the extreme of their party, uh, to the energized wing, which is the right wing in the Republican Party, the left wing, the Democratic Party. So the end result of that is that is that in order to get elected, you've got to win a primary. To win a primary, you've got to go to the, I call it the worst instincts of your party. And so you end up getting people at the extremes and not people in the center who find ways to bridge. So. Uh, you, you put the, and then you've got a press that is extraordinarily, extraordinarily politicized. If somebody watches Fox News, you know what their politics are. If mm -hmm. somebody reads the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or CNN, and after a while that goes into communities, you know if somebody lives in certain communities what their politics are. Uh, so I think Biden will actually help on that. I think he's a bit of a Reagan-esque figure who won't be as concerned about his own ego as he will be in uh, in assuaging the uh, you know the, the 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 grievances across America, and so that might help heal uh, some of what's taking place. But Bush has compounded all of this by effectively, no matter the fact that this is one of the largest majorities in American history, effectively delegitimizing the election of Joe Biden and undermining his presidency before he even starts. Uh, I can't think of anything more evil or egregious that one could do it as an elected leader than to be so selfish as to try to uh, as to try to uh, diminish somebody else's accomplishment so that you can protect your own accomplishments. It really is very disturbing, and that's the, that's the the part that's scary about it because um, Trump does have followers, and a lot of uh, sort of my friends and. Uh, when we when we talk about this, it's it's hard for us to understand um, the tremendous following that Trump continues to to, to have, um, you know. And um, as I say, I mean, and as you suggest, hopefully things uh, start turning around a little bit with with Biden. Um, but I'm wondering, with the transition in the White House. What do you see as the major issues in the Canada-U.S. relationship uh, going forward? Well, I, I think that it'll be protecting our, our, our exclusive relationship with the U.S., um, keeping the border open, keeping it thin rather than thick, making sure the, that commerce continues to flow and, uh, and that uh, protectionism does not apply to Canada. I believe in a multilateral world, and I think that a rising tide has lifted all boats. And I, it, to the extent that we can, I think we need to encourage U.S. to lead on uh, the WTO and uh, WHO. They need to be part of the Paris Accords and all of these things. Uh, I'd like to see America back, and I'd like us to be with them when they come back. But in the meantime, we have to protect our own relationship with the U.S., very material to us in terms of our economic uh, future, that we uh, continue to send 75 to 80% of our exports down to the United States. So, so we have to preserve that. 
Um, so we got a lot of we've got a lot of issues, uh, transactional issues. Could be energy, could be softwood lumber. Um, we've got all of those keeping the borders open, all of those. But just philosophically, we we need to have a tone at the top where the two countries feel closer together than they do right now. Right now, Canadians do not see themselves when they look in that U.S. mirror. Right. Always. And, and, and how important is the relationship between, this is sort of an eternal question, right, between the Prime Minister and, and, and the President? And you have all books have been written about this, but you're kind of alluding to this idea that it's important for the countries to see themselves as partners and at least um, uh, have some common ground, you know, ph philosophically. Uh, how, how important is that relationship at the top, do you think? Look, we, we can have a good relationship with America without that. Uh, governors to premiers, cabinet secretaries to cabinet ministers, citizen to citizen. The relationship fundamentally will go on anyway. But but it's a, it's the cherry on top of the cake if you can have a good relationship at the top. It allows you to bridge some really tough issues. Uh, when Brian Mulroney was the prime minister, he had a terrific relationship with Ronald Reagan. And they were able to do acid rain, for example. Uh, if we look back at the time, our maple trees were dying because of acid rain. That's largely been uh, eliminated now as a result of uh, some good work done at, at the top levels. And the free trade agreement is another one, and Arctic sovereignty. So some of those issues were just done on the basis of personality. Um, when I was uh, uh, in Washington, we, we, we just ran into this intractable problem with softwood lumber. And we finally ended up getting traction because Paul Martin and it was the prime minister then, George Bush, said, look, why don't we appoint two emissaries, uh, Frank McKenna in our case, Susan Schwab in the case of the U.S., put them in a room and, and, and negotiate a softwood on entente. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. So the, the tone at the top really is important uh, to us. It helps you bridge really intractable issues. I would like us to tackle Ming Wanzhou, for example so that Canada can do something about the two Michaels who are in jail in China and perhaps rest restore a bit of normalization in that relationship. That may be one where we need to use all the currency that we have uh, between the prime minister and the president, incoming president, who have a very good relationship. Can I just pick up on something you said about soft with lumber? Because one of the things about your career that I observe is, you know, whether it's a, a premier or uh, in business or diplomacy, it seems like deal making is a common theme amongst all of these jobs. You just alluded to, you know, the fact being put in a room with your American counterpart trying to resolve the soft, softwood lumber dispute. You know, we we teach, um, you know, dispute resolution uh, at, at the law school. I, I know a lot of people will be curious about what your approach is to dispute resolution and, and, and deal making. Do you, do you have a, a, a kind of an approach or a strategy or some, some principles that are important when, when you do that? Because you've done this throughout your, your whole career. Well, it, would, it wouldn't be as sophisticated as, the, as what you teach at the law school. But in my case, it goes back to first principles again, treat people with respect, uh, talk straight, uh, just be honest, no games, just be really honest, uh, develop a personal relationship. Uh, you know, do you like baseball? Do you like hockey? Do you, you know, what things do you like in life? Do you, do you have a relationship and, um, and then have mutual, a mutual win, uh, win-win situations. Anytime you end up winning, uh, a negotiation is usually the last negotiation you're, you're going to have with that party. And so it needs to be a, a win-win situation. And, and I find putting myself in the shoes of the other party, what's really important to them? Why are they so hung up on this issue? And if I understand that, it allows me to try to, 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 to mitigate it or come up with, with some alternatives. And, uh, and then transparency, just being really kind of honest and open and it's an awful way to negotiate, but I sometimes at some point in a negotiation would just say, look, look, you might as well know right now, I can move some on, on a couple of things. There are a couple of things I can't move on. And it's just like you've jumped almost to the end of the, 
negotiation when you do that. And the other party, if you've got a good rapport, might say, look, honestly, I can move in a couple of areas as well. Okay, so let's talk about theoretically where we could move if, if we could move. So anyway, I find uh, those, those, all, those are all very good areas, uh, but mainly just really good preparation as always and everything you do, uh, really good preparation, knowing your issues, knowing the person on the other side and being respectful and, uh, and just having a human connection. It's amazing, I'm still amazed in life uh, you know, I'm chairman now, the biggest asset manager in the world, Brookfield, and uh, and deputy chair of TD Bank, which is one of the biggest banks in the world, and so on. I'm amazed at how much of the important stuff that we do is based on relationships. Um, somebody saying, "Look, at you." Somebody told me you're good people to deal with, and and you know, I, I just wanna I just wanna follow up on this. So much of the stuff that comes in our door. It's because somebody knows somebody and respects them. So uh, it's it's important that if there's a message I would give is for you to, to engender respect and respect yourself. And um, when you deal with people, no games, no subterfuge, no artifice, just straight, just really be straight and transparent and uh, you get good wow. results. That's a really good lesson for, for our students when they when they start with us on the first day. We tell them that you begin building your professional relationship now. Uh, I mean, for, for the rest of your career, your, your classmates, as you alluded to earlier, are your colleagues for, 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 for life. And, and these are the people who are going to refer business to you and, um, and speak about you in, in your professional uh, context. And so you, you got to work on this sort of relationship, um, uh, you know, going forward. I want to ask you about another passion of yours, which is economic development. And, uh, you know, last month, uh, Statistics Canada reported that New Brunswick had the lowest economic growth of any Canadian province, just 6.8% uh, in the last 10 years. And it seems like we're constantly talking about this in, in New Brunswick. Um, why do you think our, our growth has been lagging in this way? And uh, how concerned do you think we, we should be about it? Well, I think we should be very concerned because uh, with an aging demographic, if we don't have growth, we don't have the tax base to support the, the, the needs of, of our citizenry. Um, we, we've got some structural deficits that are hard to overcome. Uh, we do have an older population. We have a highly rural population, uh, which is a problem. Our, uh, we, we have an undereducated population, which is a problem as well. And uh, you put all those together, I think we're a victim as well. And to be candid with you. Uh, Schemes such as unemployment insurance are well intended, but they've created a dependency in places like New Brunswick, and it's hard to extract ourselves. It, uh, you know, the, the safety net has become a bit of a trap, um, and so we've got a lot of structural issues like that. I think, um, not to be critical, we have a lot of good people serve the public, but the leadership has not always been as, in, as inspired as it should be around certain issues, and. Uh, and the end result of that is that we've got a we've got a pretty stagnant economy. We have not uh, up until latterly been an, um, a home for a lot of immigrants bringing new blood and new bodies, quite frankly. Um, and so um, all of those are all of those are are problems for us. Um, now I think the other problem that we just have is that we we're a traditional resource producing province, hewers of wood, jars of water. And it's been fairly easy to survive on that. At one point, we had 10 pulp and paper mills in communities like the Miramichi and Bathurst and Dalhousie and so on. Well, when you get 1,000 or 1,500 people, unionized workers in a big paper mill, there's no room for any other business in that town. It just is like a giant tree that shadows, uh, overshadows everything else. And all of a sudden, when that giant tree is gone, there's kind of nothing left. You start with a big zero. and and entrepreneurship is is not in the soil, uh, so you have to recreate it. So we are a bit of a victim of of being hewers of wood and drawers of water. And let's face it, we still exploit our resources. But we, our mines—that we have the biggest zinc mine in the world—and Brunswick Mines—it's gone. 
Uh, heat steel is gone. Uh, a lot of our mills are gone. It's hard to replace those jobs. Uh, and the jobs that are left in the forestry now are all done uh, with fewer people. Instead of people with buck saws, used to be chainsaws, now it's, now it's mechanical harvesters that work 24 hours a day. Uh, so, so it's different skill sets. And, and so a lot of that economy is, is the old economy. And we haven't worked quickly enough. And it's something I want to devote the rest of my life to, to the new economy, which is the digital economy, the knowledge economy. Uh, because my firm belief is that uh, nobody sentences us to be second class in terms of our economic growth. We make that decision ourselves. We could change that. Uh, with world-class education systems, digitalization and innovation in the economy, we could have a world-leading economy. And the pandemic has given us a real opportunity. People look at New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada as a safe haven, as a place where you could work remotely, enjoy an affordable quality of life and a good quality of life. And right now we have people beating down our doors. And if we systematically figure out how to exploit that, we could have some of the most talented people in the world working from our communities here, paying taxes here uh, and contributing to our, our communities in New Brunswick. So we do have some opportunities and I'm working with, closely with UNB now on trying to see how we can bring the digital economy mainstream into, into everybody's house and home. Uh, and uh, and move further up the the value added chain with every product we produce. Oh, that's really interesting because I was going to ask you. My next question is going to be: What are some strategies that work in terms of promoting um, economic development? It sounds like you're you're really keen on making sure that um, that that every household and every business and every region is you know connected. Um, you also alluded to immigration. There's an example in uh, the Maritimes of successful immigration, which is PEI. Um, and so the last a, a number of years, PEI has seen a lot of uh, immigration. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that's an example to follow. And, and in particular, what can we do to attract people to, to New Brunswick? Well, I think that we're, uh, we're there. PEI really put a push on immigration. In fact, I was talking about this morning with a former premier of PI on Zoom, uh, and uh, and they've got a very small population base. So even a thousand more people moves the dial. Uh, we're getting there at, more laterally. The Atlantic Immigration Pilot that has been created uh, and, and is now being made permanent uh, singles us out for more immigrants. And our government—it's up to our governments to exploit it, and up to our communities to retain. So our problem was pretty simple. We have 350,000 immigrants come to Canada every year. 65% uh, of them ended up in Toronto, another 20 or 30% ended up in uh, Vancouver and another 10 or 15% in Montreal and a few percent in the rest of Canada. Immigrants go where immigrants are. And so if you don't have immigrants, nobody's gonna come to you. So you have to create communities of immigrants and lay down, uh, lay down all of the, uh, the soil that will hold the roots of immigrants and we're starting to get there in my little community here in Kapolei now we've got I don't know hundreds of Filipinos working here and as a result of them working here a Filipino restaurant has opened up in Shediac and a mass uh, a, a mass is performed for the Filipinos a special mass so they're starting to get a community and uh, we see that in a Ukrainian community in St. John and we're see seeing uh, little communities develop, and we, we have to pile it on, do more and more of that, and uh, we have to convince New Brunswickers this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Almost every industry in New Brunswick is looking for workers. Right. So we need the warm bodies, but we need more than that. We need the desperation that immigrants bring. Every immigrant that comes here is working in something. They might be baking a loaf of bread and selling it. They might be picking flowers and selling it, but they come from cultures and economies where if you don't do that, you don't eat. And we, we, we've we become quite complacent uh, and we don't have that sense of desperation. So it, it it's good for the bloodlines to have people uh, from far off places around the world uh, coming to our province and farming our farms and uh, working in machine shops and creating new, new businesses. 
Well, speaking of ambition and, and a sense of desperation, um, I want to transition our last five minutes here to some advice for law students who are feeling pretty desperate right now because they're in the midst of their, their final exams, <laughs> their fall term exams. Um, I, I'm wondering what you think are, are some of the most important things that a law student can learn uh, while they're while they're in law school. Well, I, I fall back to basics. I the, the logic of the law is just so powerful. Discipline of learning that much that's going to be with you the rest of your life. You may not realize it, but after you your mind is expanded to be able to absorb all of the all that you've learned. It's going to stay big, and so you can absorb that. And then, thirdly, the lot everybody's got to realize it's, it's all it is is a launching pad. You might go on and do nothing but real estate the rest of your life. You might also go on and become a career politician. You might also go on and become a deputy minister. You might also create a business. Uh, you, you've got so many uh, off roads. Off ramps from from uh, from your law degree, but what you've got is an accumulated body of knowledge, advocacy skills, and uh, uh, thinking skills, and a discipline and a worldliness that's going to stand you in good stead everywhere. And if there's any advice I'd give to anybody, it's just work hard. Whatever you're doing, try to be the best that you can at it. And uh, I I'm an example of somebody who's never the best, brightest at anything, but I usually could. Uh, outwork the person on the other side of the table and uh, work hard opportunities will come um, just feel confident about yourself and work really hard and realize that you've got a, a UNB law degree in education and that's a powerful powerful uh, tool for you the rest of your life I think that's great advice I mean another challenge that um law schools are confronting and the legal profession is, uh, is confronting is, 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 is wellness and mental health in particular. And, uh, you know, some some students are really struggling in this regard and we're struggling to figure out how to how to make them uh, more resilient and how to address these challenges and teach uh, coping skills. You've had so many demanding jobs in your career, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you um, how, how you make sure that you are sort of mentally well and have a positive uh, attitude despite all the burdens uh, and challenges that, that you faced in your career? Well, you need balance. Uh, and I think balance comes from sports, uh, it comes from recreational activities, it comes from uh, contributing to your community and realizing a lot of people worse off than you are. I, uh, two quick things I'll say. One, probably the most powerful book I ever read, and I, I've read a, a lot of books and law and politics and everything else, um, was uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, 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 it's so simple that it's almost laughable. But I, I come back to that every day. I put it on my desk, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Uh, because you, when you look at it, 80 or 90 percent of the stuff that we, I, you worry about all day is small stuff. And a week later, said, "Why was I worried about that? You know, that's behind me now." And and so that's number one. I don't sweat the small stuff. And then two is just to have balance in your life. Have people who give you. Again, I go back to my wife. I remember one day I was having a hard day in the premier's office. Holy cow! I just felt the whole world was uh, falling on top of me. And I, I went home that night, and we were having supper. And I said, uh, "What did you do today, Julie?" She said, "Oh, I was uh, I was uh, shopping at." your place and so on. I said, uh, yeah, I bet you got an earful. What are they saying about me? She said, you want to know the truth? They're not talking about you. The only one that's thinking about you all the time is you. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so it gave, gave me a sense of balance that no matter what I thought was terrible in my life, people were more consumed with their life. And so I just say to the people that, that, that are going to hear this, no matter how, how upsetting uh, something is in your life or how stressful you might feel, just think about people who are desperate all over the world, desperate to escape war zones or desperate to feed their family or uh, just desperate to stay alive. 
and just think of how lucky and blessed you are and, uh, and try to put it all in perspective. Our problems are first world problems and our individual problems are often 1% problems. So I, I'm not trying to say this in a judgmental way. I have to talk to myself every day uh, to try to convince myself to think this way. Well, Mr. McKenna, I think that's a very fitting and, and wise note to, to end on. So I want to thank you so much for joining us on the UNB Law podcast. I know that our, our audience uh, is going to enjoy this very much. And you're, you're a very busy man, and we really appreciate you uh, making uh, time for us. This has been a huge highlight for me, and I really in, enjoyed our conversation. Thanks. Thanks again. Well, look, the privilege was mine. Um, to all of you, you're you're blessed. Uh, the law school is just one of the best places to be. It's one of the greatest influences in my life, and it'll uh, it'll change your life forever. And uh, so every day, sit there and enjoy the journey. Wonderful. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. That was the Honorable Frank McKenna, a graduate of the class of 1974 from UNB Law. And stay tuned for another episode of the podcast coming soon. Take care.